Please bear with me. Spirit of fairness, of respect, of kindness, minister to us, your people, we pray. May only truth be spoken, may only truth be heard, we ask. Amen. I just love that song about fairy tales and and because uh, uh, I remember how much I enjoyed them when I was a kid. And I want to just uh, read a couple of the words that uh, Siobhan sang. Because good fairy tales, like good movies, and like what Jesus taught, they're all the same thing. The divine is found in all of literature and art, just as evil is. And uh, these good stories, they uh, talk to us and encourage us to be the people God's created us to be. And here we hear, sing to me the sailor's tale, then sing about the giant whale, about how courage, be brave, shall prevail once upon a time. And the frog was changed back to a prince to show us how it's love that wins. And we'll believe in happy endings once upon a time. See, that's gospel. That's gospel. The courage to do what's right. The courage to protect the weaker. To be grounded in that love that gives us the ability to stand up and ask for fairness. The love of Jesus and the love that I mostly speak about here is agape love. All loves should include agape love. Romance, friendship, family. But agape love does not require nice feelings because we're called to agape love our enemies and you don't have to like them. But agape love is that divine ability that signifies our identity as human beings. To be human at our best is to be divinity revealed. And so that agape love, I like to sum up as kindness, respect, and fairness. Fairness and respect go together. We treat people fairly when we respect them. And we don't treat them fairly, generally, when we disrespect them. Fairness cannot accept disrespect. And people being treated as second-class citizens, that's not fair. Because everybody, no matter how twisted and unmanageable their lives they may become, everybody is part of the gift of the Creator, and everybody is part of the divine family. Yes, we can turn into prodigals, but we're still family. We were instinctively wanting fairness when we were children. And as parents, we instinctively taught fairness because fairness is intrinsic to what it is to be a human being. It's part of our divine nature. We were taught to share food. You remember that? We were taught that if we're with people, we can't just bring some food and eat it ourselves. I don't know about you, but that just didn't go in my home, right? If you're going to bring out food, you've got to share it. If you don't want to share it, wait till everybody's gone, <laughs> right? Just basic fairness. And children have an acute sense of what is unfair, especially when they feel like they're being treated unfairly. He got an extra cookie. Oh, Dad, she stayed up later. How come she got to stay up later, right? I mean, how many of those memories do some of us have, right? Fairness is a part of who we are. It's so important that we learn this, that we are a divine, and it's the divine gift. Fairness is that dimension of divinity, another one of the many dimensions of our divinity. And I emphasize this because in the United Church, we have basically known and taught that for many years. But most Christian churches 
from the institutional ones like the Roman Catholic and, and Anglican and Presbyterian and to the more free ones like Pentecostal and Baptist, free in terms of their worship style. If you Google Christianity, you still find that the primary story that people have learned about Christianity is that we are born defective that we are born separated from God in some way. And when you start with a story like that, it's hard to get past it. Because then you're born with an attachment injury to your very mother and father. And let's face it, when we're born into this world, if we have an attachment injury with our parents, our lives become a mess, and it takes a lot of work to get over that. But most of Christians have grown up hearing that unless they go to Mass, unless they confess, unless they go to church, unless they say the sinner's prayer, unless they do what the priest says, unless they do what the preacher says, unless they do this, 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 or even give assent to a creed so they can become a member, unless they do that, they're second class at best. And of course, then you've got the fundamentalists who are telling them they're going to hell. And so Christianity since the 1300s has been based on a cruel lie that we're born separated from God, that Jesus had to die on a cross. God had to kill his one good son so that he could forgive the rest of us. I mean, honestly, what Christianity has said about God since the 14th century, if a parent was that way, the CAS would come and take their kids from them. And you want to know why people today who have Christian affiliation, they either live with constant guilt and shame, constantly not feeling good enough because of that attachment injury they got. Or they just chuck the whole thing and say, I don't need this Christianity. The historical Jesus and the early church did not think like that. They grew up being told in the Jewish faith at that time, that they needed to sacrifice animals to get forgiven. But Jesus said no. What did Jesus teach? He said, love fulfills all the law. <laughs> the early Christian movement, and right up until the 13th century, was a liberation movement. A liberation from all those lies, all that negativity, all that shame, all that judgment. What is it that the New Testament taught? If you're kind, respectful, and fair, and these are the fruit of the Spirit, you can do anything you want. There should be no law against you doing anything that's kind, respectful, and fair. And you're God's kid. You're made in the image of God. That's the only thing God cares about, is kindness, respect, and fairness, agape love. That's what the prophets taught. They said, oh... Yeah, you got all these sacrifices you're making, you got your songs, you got your hymns, you got your prayers, but you're not being kind to each other. Your sacrifices are a stench in the nose of God. That's what the Old Testament prophets taught. God doesn't care what we do, so long as we're kind, respectful, and fair. That's the family business we've been born into. But we have a dilemma, because the universe is not intrinsically fair. There are possibilities of chaos everywhere at any time. The physical world is inherently unfair because it is totally random. I mean, look at all the randomness in how we're born. Some people are born healthy. Some people are born with disabilities. Some people don't make it. It's totally random. Totally random. Our sexual orientation, our gender identity is totally random. And so we often have to teach our kids not only to be fair, but that life isn't fair. How do you put those two together? But you see, that's the thing in life. You have to put those two things together. The earth spins at 1,000 miles an hour. And while it's spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, it's going around the sun at 64,000 miles an hour. Now, what could possibly go wrong there? Well, how about hurricanes? How about tornadoes? The middle half of our planet is molten lava. What could possibly go wrong there? 
earthquakes, tsunamis, tidal waves. Random and chaos, random chance and chaos are the ground of existence. That is the basic reality of the universe. In Genesis chapter 1, properly translated, says, When God created the heavens and the earth, did he do it out of nothing? That's what I grew up thinking. Just spoke and everything appeared. No, 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 no. Doesn't say that. When God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Chaos. God's job, what we call God, that mysterious, amazing force, is that thing that takes chaos and evolves over 13 billion years, what we have today, and is continuing to evolve life. God has to deal with chaos, void, darkness, and has been dealing with it for over 13 billion years, evolving something amazing, a thing of beauty, where people can love so powerfully that they're even willing to sacrifice their lives, even for a stranger sometimes. There is still chaos, but God is in the business of evolving it and redeeming it. That's how amazing God is. A God who just kind of, you know, oh, oh, you know, earth, light, yeah, boom, boom, boom. That's not much help. Because if God could do things just like that so effortly, then God is a megalomaniac dictator because then we shouldn't have tidal waves and we shouldn't have tsunamis and we shouldn't have holocausts and we shouldn't have a war in Russia. God struggles like we struggle. It's part of life. But God makes progress. We're better off today. There's more fairness in this world today than there was 10,000 years ago. But the other thing that makes life unfair, that's even more difficult to deal with than the random chaos of life, it's the challenge of evil. Because we are divine, we have free will. Our capacity for fairness can turn into an insatiable hunger for more and more. Anger and fear can turn our divine light into the dark side of evil. We don't have to call evil Satan or Beelzebub or Lucifer. We've got better names for evil now. We can call them by their current names, racism, sexism, anthropocentrism, in other words, humans first and not caring about nature. Militarism, narcissism, these are spiritual because they operate in the realm of spirit and because they possess a quasi-immortality to them. They keep coming back generation after generation demanding our attention to deal with. The most unfair things in this world are not just nature's chaos, but what hurts the most is the chaos and pain that comes from human beings as they move from kindness to cruelty, from respect to discounting people. And when they use nature like it's some disposable plastic to be thrown out. And when they create an economic system that favors the stronger over the weaker. We see a beautiful example of that evil today as the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, making her stand in front of them all, shaming her. And haven't we been shaming women for thousands of years through the double standard in how we apply sexual laws? Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. Moses' law said to stone her, what do you say? How unfair is that? First of all, it's unfair to take a private matter and to make it public. That's just mean. It's nasty. It's evil. And then there's the double standard. Where's the guy? Well, it's always about the woman. Blame the woman. Crucify the woman. And you women know that better than me. Back in the day, not much different today. Men could have more than one wife. That wasn't adultery. They could have kept prostitutes called concubines. That wasn't adultery. What a heck of a system. Women pay a heavy price 
because men have and some still do think that they are more entitled to respect and choices than women. That's not fair. That is evil. But it's so normalized that throughout history, most people have not even been aware of it as evil. Our indigenous brothers and sisters paid a heavy price and still do as they seek to heal from their traumas. They paid a heavy price as indigenous people around the world because empires thought that these people were lesser. They weren't fully human. They could do with them as they will and do with them they did. And we're just in Canada beginning to get in touch with what we've done in the name of God that has been the actual expression of evil through our government and our churches over a hundred years of taking kids from their homes and teaching them that they were evil as Indians and we had to make them into white people or kill them for trying. This is the ongoing struggle between good and evil. And ironically, to maintain those systems, the ruling classes have historically sent their boys to boarding school about the time they're around nine or ten years of age. Why? to get them away from their mothers, to get them away from their natural, God-given, divine sense of compassion. Put them in those boarding schools. Beat them hard when they don't do the right thing. Be tough. Beat the compassion out of them so that they can be the generals who send their troops into cannon fodder without any chance of winning sometimes, so that they can be the CEOs today who don't care about the environment, who don't care about a fair wage. The system trains the boys to become the rulers who do the evil, thinking there's no problem with it. It's a system. It's a system. But Jesus never accepted the options that were given him. Today the options were to disregard the law and say that adultery was all right or stone a woman. But he never accepts unfair options, and neither should we. You know, adultery is not being married and having sex with somebody else. Adultery is doing that without your partner's knowledge and permission. That's what's unfair about adultery. Whatever a couple agrees to, that's not unfair. But when things are done secretly and without a partner's agreement and against what their deal is, that's adultery. And it's not right. It's not fair. And stoning a woman for doing something that the man with her and many standing around her get away with isn't fair either. So Jesus writes in the sand. I don't know what he wrote. Maybe it was some of the Ten Commandments. And then he says something very fair. If anyone has not sinned, pick up a stone, knock yourself out. But of course, we all make mistakes. We all sin. And so they're flummoxed. They don't know what to do or say. Then Jesus writes in the sand again. Who knows what? But maybe he started writing the names of everybody from the oldest to the youngest because then they started to walk away the oldest from the youngest maybe when he started writing their names they thought oh my goodness he, he and then they start thinking about the things they're ashamed of they start thinking about the things they've been keeping secret maybe he's found out and so they just start taking off jesus says woman where are they has no one condemned you she said no one sir and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, don't commit adultery. Jesus does not ignore the reality of who we are. He knows the woman was committing adultery, but he doesn't condemn us. That's a very different picture than the God most people grow up knowing about. We have a loving father and mother who, when the prodigal shows up, having squandered the inheritance having put himself in a situation of shame and ill repute, Ill repute, does the father just kind of play it tough and say, oh, let's make you grovel, buddy? No, 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 no. He sees the son from afar, and he runs, and he grabs that kid 
Because that's the kind of love we were born from and born to. And so we continue to learn how to move from disrespect for ourselves and others to a deep respect. And a deep respect of Mother Earth. For this is all the divine gift crafted and worked at over 13 billion years out of chaos and crazy hardship and, and, and randomness. It's so precious. We're all so precious. Life is so precious. We're learning to move from being unkind to loving kindness. Moving from being victims to the satisf satisfaction of taking our place at the table in God's business of making a better world, a world that's fairer than the one we have now, fairer to ourselves, fairer to others, for like love, we must be fair to others as we are fair to ourselves. If we don't love ourselves, we don't have much love to give. If we aren't fair to ourselves, we don't have much fairness to give. We need to have that balance of love and fairness to ourselves, to others, as we stand up for those who are not receiving it. Fairness requires that everybody get what they truly need. That's what God intends. And that is what God has equipped us with as God's divine agents in this world to do. It's amazing. Thanks be to God.